Worthy is his name. Jesus' his name is worthy. It's the name above all names. And the Bible says that every knee shall bow, every tongue confess he is Lord. Peace be with you. Hallelujah. You can be louder. Peace be with you. Hallelujah. Again, peace be with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. We saw earlier on how God's mission is truly our hope because God alone crossed that line and in Jesus he announced that in him the kingdom of God had arrived. That now humanity, that hitherto had no hope, now in Christ had hope. I guess it's important for us to ask right from the beginning, where lies your hope? I wonder when you turn on your television set and it seems as though evil reigns, injustices continue to thrive, the poor are getting poorer. And when you consider your church, the state church, and you honestly wonder, where on earth is Christianity going? Should we even quit this church, which when you enter it, you wonder, what difference is there between this church and the world? And you wonder, is there hope? Brothers and sisters, in Christ, in Jesus, the one of Nazareth, we have in him the only hope of this world. For listen, not evil, evil does not have the last word. For God is at work in his world. We have a sure hope. For justice will triumph. Light will overturn darkness. For in him, the king of all kings has come to reign in his world. And a day comes when all evil and injustice will flee. That is our hope. Just like the mustard seed, it may be invisible in the ground, just like the yeast. And you know what that yeast is? You know that little flour that you put in the big amount of flour that causes bread to rise. Those of you who make bread, you know that little flour. What do you call it? All right, you got it. That's the yeast. Just like the yeast, God is at work in his world. And he is our sure hope. And so it's important to ask, therefore, in this light, in the light of this great scheme of God, the mission of God, the kingdom of God. What is your life about? What is my life about? I ask, what are you pursuing? What's the primary pursuit about your life? Suppose you were asked, what's your mission statement here on earth? I wonder what your answer would be. I hope that you would state that God's mission defines mine. It is God's mission that defines the location where I live and how I live. God's mission, brothers and sisters, the kingdom of God, our life. That's the lesson we learn as we study together that first invitation by Jesus to those early disciples. We read about them in Mark chapter 1, how Jesus, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew. They had listened to him announce the good news of the kingdom of God. Can you turn with me there, if you may? Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Jesus was in Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, the kingdom of God. Jesus had announced, and Simon and Andrew maybe had heard him as he spoke by the lake, 
by the sea, which was the location of their business. They heard him announce the inbreaking of the kingdom of God with his coming. They had seen some of his miracles. They had heard. They heard him say that those who desired or would participate in that kingdom, those who desired to be part of what God was doing, inaugurating in his world, would have to enter by repentance. Repent, Jesus said, over and over again. Believe in the good news. Repentance. Repentance. For you see, repentance was the way in which everyone, and indeed all, would turn away from their ways, from a choice of a lifestyle based on other than God, and turning toward God, turning everything towards God's will, God's purpose, God's glory. For it is God's will, God's purpose, God's glory that defined his kingdom. Repent, turn away from your ways, whatever they are, sinful or good, but turn them all to Jesus, his kingdom and his purpose. Jesus was calling for a radical discipleship, unlike anything before. Because you know, to be a disciple was not anything new that Jesus was calling for. Because at the time, there were many teachers. They were called rabbis. And the way in which people learned from the teachers was by following them. And in following them, they simply fashioned or adjusted their lives by imitating what their teachers did. But what Jesus was calling for, no other rabbi had called for before. What Jesus was asking, no teacher before him had asked, repent. For Jesus was demanding all change. All change. I don't know whether it happens here with your trains. For when you uh, buy a stop and the train is yet to get to its destination, it says, it announces the station and asks those who need to change at that station to change. Does that happen here? And then when it gets to the final destination, what does the announcer say? All change. All change. In Jesus was the announcement all change for those who would fashion their lives after the kingdom of God. That is repentance. And the example we have is Peter. And it's given to us in Luke chapter 5. The gospel of Luke chapter 5. It's there we understand this call, this invitation, where Jesus said, come, follow me. Peter's example teaches us, says to us, what this change entailed. For we are told in that chapter how indeed by the same lake, the lake of Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to him as he preached. He saw the water's edge to boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. And among them certainly Simon, the son of Jonah, the brother of Andrew. And so the text tells us that he asked Simon to put out a little from the shore and then Jesus sat in Simon's boat and began to teach. And I wonder how Simon was being attentive for you know he had had a very difficult night. For that night he had caught nothing together with his colleagues, his partners in the fishing business. When he had finished speaking, this is Jesus. He notices how Simon is truly still very sad. And to Simon's amazement, Jesus says to him, put your, put your nets into the deep water on the right side and let down the nets for a big catch. And Simon said, Master, we had a tough night. It was a difficult night. Verse 5, for we worked hard all night and caught nothing. And you see, for Simon, this was not abnormal. 
Any of you who live by the sea, whose tradition is fishing, I lived for a while near a lake, and the fishermen would often tell us when they would catch a lot of fish, or nights when they would catch nothing. So this would not have been unusual for Simon and his colleagues, Andrew among others. But he says, you know what? I have seen the rabbi do amazing things. And so he says, okay, master, because of your word, I guess you could do an amazing thing. And it's really between faith and doubt. Peter says, mm, not sure. But anyway, okay, it does no harm. It does no harm. I'll just throw the nets as he has demanded. He is the teacher. When they had done so, chapter 5, verse 6, the gospel of Luke, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. I wonder, as Peter sees this, Simon, is he making a connection between the kingdom of God, how it is who God who created the fishes and everything else could call them up into his net? Simon signaled his partners from the other boats. For you see, the catch was so mighty, he needed help. They came and they helped him. They came and filled both boats so full, they began to sink. This had never happened in Peter's fishing career. When he saw this, he thought, oh my, oh my. Go away from me, he said. He makes a connection. For in meeting Jesus, he meets one unlike any other he has. He's been preaching about the kingdom. He's been inviting them to turn all from their wicked ways. Jesus has been teaching and preaching about repentance. Peter makes the connection. He says to him, go away from me. I am a sinful man. Let me say this to you. When you have a genuine encounter with God in Christ, you begin to see yourself for who you really are. A sinner desperately in need of God's grace. When you, remember, wasn't it Isaiah? He had a vision of God. What was his response? Woe unto me, I'm a sinful man. It is true, when you and I have an encounter with God, the blazing light of his holiness exposes our sinfulness. Peter saw this, for he and all his companions were astonished that he, Jesus, had even power over the fishes of the sea. And so were James John and his brother, the sons of Zebedee. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. From now on, the fisherman, the fisher of men. No, no, the fisher of fishes. The fisherman is henceforth to become a fisher of men. The fisherman becomes a fisher of men. And the Bible tells us he and his colleagues, Andrew, and the sons of Zebedee, they left everything. They left everything and followed Jesus. What does this mean? They left everything. Actually, we know that occasionally Peter, Simon, and his brother Andrew and their partners occasionally went to fish. But it simply means this, that from now on, everything about their lives was to be shaped by the purposes, by the will of Jesus, by the dictates of their master. They surely turned everything, including their fishing, towards the purposes of Christ. Jesus' invitation to all, Jesus' invitation to Peter, 
and indeed to all of us, is simply the same. That you and I, as Jesus invites us into kingdom life, come, come, as you follow me, Jesus says in Mark chapter 1, verse 16. Come. This is an invitation into God's mission. Come. As you follow me, Jesus said, you will become. As you follow me, I will make you a fisher of men. As you follow me, as you follow, you become. Please notice with me that it is in the following that you become. The critical thing then is not what you are becoming, it is the following, because the following of Jesus is that process that causes you to become that which God intends you to be. So it is critical then that you and I respond to that invitation. Come, and like Jesus said to Peter, do not be afraid, for the work belongs to him. It is not you, it is him. It is not you, just as we saw, he is at work like the mustard seed or the yeast. Do you remember that passage in John chapter 10, verse 16, in which Jesus said, I have other sheep, they belong to me, but they are not inside? Mark chap Luke, John chapter 10, the gospel of John chapter 10, it's a very important verse. I have other sheep. They are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. They shall be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus says, I have other sheep. Whose sheep are they? Whose sheep are they? Excuse me? Whose sheep are they? Jesus. Who knows where they are? Who knows where they are? Jesus. Who will bring them in? Excuse me? Who? Who brings them in? So why are you afraid? Why are you ever afraid of talking about him? It's Jesus to bring them in. It's not you. You know, the missionaries got it wrong. Those who said they were carrying Jesus to Africa, taking Jesus to Africa, who takes who where? Who carries who? Who does the work? It's Jesus. So it's Jesus taking us places. It's Jesus who speaks through us. If only you will allow him. Your life then is to be shaped by his purpose, by his will. Hear him say, come as you follow me. I never will forget my first visit to Sudan. Sudan at the time, under Islamic rule, Sharia law. And I was terrified going to Sudan. I had been invited by the student movement to come and speak at a conference. And at the time, I had been told that it was dangerous to go into that country as a Christian minister. And so I knew I had to disguise I went in as a visitor to the Ugandan embassy. But what I didn't take concern about is the size of the Bible I carried. As a flight was landing, I remembered I had a massive Bible. And I thought it's very difficult to hide a big Bible like this. So I prayed. Any of you read Andrew's books, Brother Andrew, as he took Bibles across during the communist era? You remember how Andrew prayed that God would close the eyes of the detectives? That God would close their eyes not to see the Bibles? I prayed that prayer as I entered the Sudan. And I landed and they asked me lots of questions and I surely told them I had gone to visit the Ugandan embassy in the Sudan. And I did, by the way, just so you know. I actually visited the embassy. And thanks be to God, they didn't see the Bible. But as soon as I landed and went through the immigration, whew, thanks be to God, and then the customs, and then across, I saw Daniel, Daniel who had come to wait for me, and he was seated across reading his Bible openly without fear. And I thought, ouch. 
As soon as we sat into the taxi, Daniel told me, everybody in this place is a spy of the government. And so we enter, and I'm kind of afraid. But as soon as we enter, Daniel begins to speak to the taxi man, the one driving us back to our residence. And he speaks, starts to speak to them about Jesus. And I'm thinking, I thought he told me everybody is a spy. He goes on and he speaks to him. And clearly, there is a conversation. It's all in Arabic. I don't get a thing. Before too long, I saw Daniel remove his Bible from his bag, cleaned it of the papers that were in there, one by one, and then hand it over to him. And I thought, Daniel, your name is in the Bible. He was not afraid. When we got to our destination, he smiled. They said bye to each other, and I thought, he's taken your Bible, your name is in there. And Daniel looked at me, and he said, it's okay, Jesus will take care. I entered the conference. It was much bigger than this, or quite about this size. And you know what, to my amazement, they were singing the praises of Jesus in Arabic. For the first time in my life, my group of young people singing the praises of Jesus in Arabic. And I thought all must be believers. I get in there and clearly Christ is at work in this place. And I'm thinking, what can I say here? What can I do here? I started teaching God's word. I just started telling the story of Jesus in the gospels. And at the end of it, I asked, is there anyone who wants to turn their lives to Jesus? And then there was a young lad sitting at the back without me knowing. This was a young man who had grown up a Muslim, was a Muslim. And he is one of those who said, yes, I want to turn my life over to Jesus. Friends, Jesus is at work. Fear not. Simply come. Follow him wherever he leads you, wherever, because it is him who is at work. Let us pray. Are you afraid? Remember, it is him at work. It is him who will bring anyone in. The invitation to you is to simply come. Fashion your life. Where you live, where you go, what you do, it must all be changed because of God's mission. Lord, thank you for your word. Teach us to hear your voice and to obey you. Amen.